system. Our guest in this segment is Roy Ramey. You may remember Roy's name from the 2020 elections. He was a candidate for uh, Ag Commissioner in the Republican primary. Uh, ultimately, Ken Leonhart won that election and is also running for re-election, most likely, as I understand it. Roy will once again challenge him in the Republican primary. Roy, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thank you for having me on your show again, Rob. It's a real honor and privilege to be here with you. And you may uh, note from the way Roy is dressed, he is a U.S. Army veteran. <laughs> yes, sir. Correct? Uh, yes, sir. Matter of fact, I just retired a year ago with 33 years of service. I uh, spent time in Iraq as a combat veteran and a lot of wonderful military experiences over the years. Started off as a private mm-hmm. and worked my way all the way up to a, a senior officer as a lieutenant colonel. So, uh, when uh, Where did you grow up first and foremost, Roy? Uh, well, I was born in Huntington mm-hmm. uh, in Cabell County, uh, which is about as far on the other end of the state from here as you can get. It is. Uh, I've lived in some other places over the years, uh, Indiana, uh, Minnesota. Uh, my father was uh, uh, construction and uh, worked other places, but uh, then I came back to West Virginia, of course, and that's ultimately my roots. And I went to Marshall University, of mm-hmm. course, and graduated there. Got my commission with ROTC there, and, and I've just stayed in the area ever since, other than some military tours where I've had to go out of state and out of the country for that. How did you decide to uh, enter ROTC training and, and obviously then commit to the Army? Yeah, so uh, my father, my natural father, was killed in Vietnam, and uh, my stepdad was also a Vietnam veteran. And all of my uncles and a bunch of my cousins were military service all the way back to World War I. Uh, grandfather was a veteran from World War I, so I had that military influence and background in my family mm-hmm. and decided that I wanted to be in the military myself. And through the influence of my stepdad, who just raised me as his own son, uh, took me in as his own. Uh, he brought me up with those good values, and I just decided that, uh, that I wanted to be an officer uh, through his influence, and that's the route that I took. Well, first and foremost, Roy, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, very sorry to hear about your father mm. in uh, Vietnam. I had a cousin who was in Vietnam, and mm. uh, we can we can go for hours yeah. about Vietnam. Sure. Um, I'm sure the effect it's had on you know, families the, uh, and such. Uh, you know, on that point, uh, everybody says, you know, what the good Lord gives, he can take away. Well, mm. I look at it as what the good Lord takes away, he gives back. Yeah. Because while he took away my father, and I'm kind of a bit of a fatalist. I think that was just set. That's what God, God's plan was, whether we understood it sure. or not. Well, he gave me back a wonderful father uh, as a substitute, and uh, and I think he did a good job raising me. And some people don't have a good experience with a step-parent, but uh, I had a wonderful experience, and he gave me uh, great values, treated me in his own, and um, I just couldn't be more proud to be his son and represent him as well as being my genetic father's son as well well so. stated you you've gotten a uh, an, an endorsement from military uh, folks who have uh, given you their endorsement kent leadhart's a, a marine corps veteran uh, why did they give you the endorsement and not kent yes so uh, <clears throat> you're referring to an organization called vets for vet leadership mm-hmm. and uh, uh, their tagline is bet on a vet uh, they promote uh, constitutional conservatives uh, to run for office uh, veteran constitutional conservatives and, uh, and they believe that I have those value sets uh, that's representative of what they believe in and, uh, and have chose to endorse me because of that. I don't regard the agricultural position as a political position, per se, like, say, the governor, for instance, and mm-hmm. the constitutional officers <clears throat> of the state of West Virginia. Uh, so how do conservatism, how does conservatism, constitutionalism enter into the ag commissioner's job? Sure. Well, uh, as you may know, or and some people don't, I know uh, uh, I'm on a constant learning path, and for many years I didn't realize the Agricultural Commission was an elected position as well, but it is elected because of the influence that it has over farming and over food production in this state. Uh, there are five other constitutional, conserv- uh, constitutional officers rather, besides the governor, which includes the Commissioner of Agriculture. West Virginia is one of 14 states, I believe it's 14, that has that as an elected position. Some states, it's a secretary of agriculture appointed by the governor, so it's part of the governor's team. Uh, but for whatever reason, the uh, the folks who formed our constitution in West Virginia felt that that needed to be a directly elected position. And, uh, you know, it has to do with regulating our food. And everybody needs food, water, and shelter as the foundation. So you want somebody that's going to represent your values when you're trying to control that. 
Now our government passes a lot of laws and then the bureaucracy ends up passing regulations, enacting the regulations uh, through those bureaucracies in controlling the food. And that comes from the, mostly the federal government and also the state government. There's some local pieces that fit in there. Uh, but you want somebody that's going to represent the values of the people of the state. And in this case, uh, you know, it's a state elected office. They're not there to enact federal law or to enforce or uphold federal law. Your job as an elected official within that jurisdiction, in this case West Virginia, is to represent the people of West Virginia and what's best for West Virginians, not the United States as a whole, not the USDA, not what the government wants, but representing the people. So uh, I don't feel that uh, the bureaucracy has been very representative in my years of farming. And uh, what I see again and again is the commissioner of agriculture is the guy that either stands in the way, stops or, or hinders the freedom that I'm expecting farmers to be able to have. And then also as a consumer, because I also eat food, uh, I don't just produce it, uh, there's foods that I want to be able to get as well, and I know that some of my neighbors want that we're not allowed to have. Raw milk is one. Uh, that's just a, one example. Uh, it's been a passion of mine to, uh, uh, to legalize that for years. I was part of the team that was able to get herd shares passed several years ago. Unfortunately, the herd shares program, as it was enacted, uh, is highly regulated, uh, and most farmers just don't want to get into that. And a lot of consumers don't want to be mm-hmm. bundled down to uh, to having to get one gallon of milk every week in the case of a herd share. Uh, even if you're on vacation and you don't need it, or when it's Christmas time and you want to do a lot of baking and you want extra, you can't just buy extra unless you go get contracted into more herds. So there's a lot of problems with the program. Uh, it's very costly with the uh, uh, inspections. you know, And that's just one example on how... Uh, there's way too much regulation, and if we can cut those regulations and get government out of our business, then we can promote more opportunity for more young people. Right now in West Virginia, uh, there's a general sense of hopelessness with a lot of, uh, particularly the economy. Uh, we have folks that are uh, just in despair in a lot of cases because there's not a lot of opportunity here. Well, uh, if you can create opportunity through farming, through low uh, infrastructure, well, then you've now created opportunities for people to produce food for their local economy, their local community, uh, and that also uh, contributes to the food security and the economy of that particular local area. Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Roy, for joining us today. Yes, sir. Uh, I assume you're in the uh, National Guard, Army National Guard. Is that Actually, correct? I've been in all three components, uh, okay. Army for sure, for yeah. all of it, but I've been in the Army National Guard, active duty, and the Army Reserve. Okay. Uh, yeah. I ended up retiring at the Army Reserve, but mm. I spent 26 years here in the West Virginia National Guard. Sure. Okay. Uh, what is the size of the Department of Agriculture, West Virginia Department of Agriculture? In other words, as agricultural commissioner, are you uh, overseeing a small group of folks, a large group of folks? I have no sense at all. Sure. Uh, so it's the West Virginia Department of Agriculture is the specific department that uh, the commissioner would be in charge of. And, uh, and there's a few hundred. Uh, I've heard around 300 employees. I'm sure that's flexing, you know, depending on the particular uh, season, uh, how many people have left or new people hiring in, but around 300 employees. And, uh, you know, certainly that's, uh, in my experience, uh, from managing a group of people, from being a commander, I actually commanded more people than that in Iraq uh, when I was just a young captain. So yeah. I certainly have the experience to run uh, run a department of that size and uh, operate in a business. Uh, of course, you know, we're not like a big corporation uh, as a farm, uh, but I understand how to run a business and how to manage and set the goals and so forth so that fits in with my business experience as well i've also operated a construction company and so you know it just all fits in with my experience and background as being able to manage something of that size and responsibility are the concerns of the farmers the same in the eastern panhandle as they are in the in your area of state yeah and that's a great question i would say that there's an overlap of some of the concerns are similar Uh, And then there's unique things particular for each reason. I've happened to get around the state in a lot of areas, and uh, and everybody has their own unique things. Some of it's not necessarily geographic. It's just what happens to be the thing in the area. 
Uh, over here, I've noticed, uh, and I've heard for years, there's a big apple orchard industry, uh, and that's really significant. We don't have a lot of that in the rest of the state, although there are some. Uh, you know, in some areas, uh, it's beef. Uh, other areas, it's poultry. So, you know, there are geographic differences amongst the areas, and uh, I think there's room for all of it. You know, West Virginia is a pretty diverse state. Yeah. When you go around and look at just the geography and you look at the people anyway, there's, you know, pockets here and there that have their unique things. And, uh, and so, yeah, there's some different concerns here. But the common thing is that there's too much government involved in our business. Uh, there's too many taxes. That's another thing that I hear a lot about. And, uh, uh, you know, folks telling us that we got to do this or we can't do that. I, I gather you farm. You made some reference to your farm. Yes, sir. Uh, did you, were you born into a farm, or did you purchase a farm later in life? Uh, well, that's a, actually both. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid growing up, uh, we farmed. Uh, we raised hogs. We raised corn, uh, chickens. Uh, you know, it was all small scale, and uh, and I learned, I learned how to work hard for sure. Uh, I decided I didn't want anything to do with farming at that point <laughs> mm -hmm. as a young man. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I wanted to do anything else besides farming and besides construction. My dad worked construction, mm -hmm. and uh, and I didn't want any part of either of those. So I went off to college, and as soon as I graduated from college, I thought, you know, farming wasn't too bad. And I started looking for my own. It took me almost 20 years to, to settle on buying my own place, but I do have my own place that I bought. Uh, I did not inherit it at all, so... Uh, so I guess I'm an old farmer that now is on a new place and trying to instill those values to my daughter. I got a 14 year old daughter and and she helps on the farm quite a bit. And so I just want to pass down a legacy to her and uh, and give her that opportunity for something in her future. I gather you're a proponent then of farmland protection. Uh, to a certain extent, you want to explain what you mean? Well, uh, uh, putting uh, farmland under easements so that they will be protected uh, from development. Yeah, and that's a good program. That uh, USDA has such a program for that. Uh, I've heard of a couple of private institutions mm -hmm. that do that, uh, that's voluntary. Uh, and certainly as long as uh, folks voluntarily go into that program, I think it's a wonderful program. I would never want the government to force something on us because that takes away an opportunity that you as the landowner would want. But I think you should uh, keep your farmland in farming. You know, we only have so much farmland available, and uh, and people ought to just respect the uh, the fact that we need food. I mentioned before, everybody's got to have food. Uh, I haven't met anybody yet on this planet that doesn't need to eat. So I think having farmland, uh, having quality land is important uh, that we're growing on it. Soil is the foundation of that. Uh, there's a lot you can do on a lot of places. I've seen good plants growing on rocky soil. I've seen uh, goats yeah. <laughs> growing on rocky yeah. soil. Uh, but, you know, the better your soil is, uh, the the better the better quality food you're going to end up producing in general. I ask the easy questions. Maria asks the hard questions. <laughs> All right. I'm ready. If I get to them, though. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maria, can you pull your mic a little closer to sure. you? Sure. You're up next. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Uh, oh, you're, ready. Oh, you're, yeah. you're deferring. I'm deferring. Okay. Um, so you made reference to, um, uh, to you know, what we know here. Um, we obviously have a lot of apple orchards, peach orchards, and boy, is it beautiful out there right now, isn't mm -hmm. it? Everything blooming. Yep. And your allergies. And this is beautiful too. country. Yeah, all it really as is. A whole, so. um, but you know, one of the struggles that we hear um, are how difficult it is to maintain, obviously orchards, farms, what have you. And you know, we're we've got a lot of um, a lot of developers in the area who are um, offering pretty hefty prices for um, for land. Mm -hmm. um, what about the you know, the struggle there um, between development, which we've encountered here, and those farms or orchards. Sure. And I've seen some of that in just a few days that I've been getting around this part of the, the country. And You're good. And, and so uh, uh, some of the things that I know about that comes down to, uh, uh, well, individual choice. So if, if I'm the landowner, I got to decide, do I want to take a little bit of money? 
and uh, and sell this to a farmer who can't pay a lot for it, or do I want to take a lot of money and sell it to a developer who is wanting to pay me big money? And so there's some personal choice in there in that. Uh, I think you need to use ethics in making your decision, and uh, and ethics is not all about money, of course. Uh, the other part is, uh, you know, what do you have local? Uh, you got some things in your local toolbox, such as a county commission who uses zoning, and uh, you know, certain land can be zoned as this needs to be agriculture or this needs to be development or industrial or you know whatever that area is suited for based on what the people in that local community know they need uh, or don't need so did that answer your question ma'am yeah. okay mm -hmm. okay thank you uh i assume the fact that you're running you have some problem with the way that the agriculture commissioner is doing his job now would you explain the problems of what what is he not doing that he should be doing Sure. So uh, right now there's a heavy uh, bureaucracy amongst the department. And by the way, I'm not disparaging anything with uh, with the commissioner's character. Uh, he's a nice guy. Uh, and, you know, I don't know anybody that's that said anything uh, uh, derogatory there. But a lot of people do have a problem with how the department is run as a whole, uh, particularly. Uh, uh, let's go into recent uh, things. There's a new uh, uh, there's a new permit that's required as a farmer's market permit for all farmers. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were covered under the farmer's markets that we sold under. Uh, so, for instance, there's a, a farmer's market that I'm a part of in Huntington called the Wild Ramp Market. And they had to get a permit to operate as a farmer's market. And all of the producers who worked through there uh, were just covered under that one permit. Well, that sounds great. We're all covered under that permit. Uh, well, not anymore. Uh, they went through a couple of years ago when none of us were allowed to get in that uh, that shiny white building in Charleston and uh, doing some things that we didn't know was going on, and they ended up passing a new uh, law that required us all to get a, another permit now. So instead of being covered under the farmer's market permit that we were selling through, well, now we've got to each have our own. And they can't even tell you when you ask the uh, the coordinator of that program what does this get us? Because I sat in a meeting and listened to other farmers. This wasn't just me stirring this up, asking, what do we get out of this? What are you doing for us that we're paying for this license? And the lady couldn't even tell. She said, you get a permit. You get a piece of paper. And that was it. It's like we don't need a piece of paper to tell us that we're allowed to sell our food to somebody else. In my case, I'm an incorporated business. I have a business license from the state of West Virginia that authorizes me to sell to the public. Why do I need another license from somebody else specifically to sell food? Now, and it just doesn't make sense. Okay, the, the additional license or the change in the procedure, was that, it was obviously implemented by Agriculture Commissioner, but did the state legislators actually make that provision? Did they make the change? They sure did. So it was okay. passed in legislation. But let me tell you this, and, and that was I'm glad you pointed that out. Uh, this bureaucrat that was telling us that we get a piece of paper said we asked why this was happening and she said because the legislator wanted it well i don't know about y'all but i've been around legislators a lot over the last several years and learned a lot about how the procedure works and the legislatures don't just come in and say one day well i want this i want some new permit and make it up and pass a law they go by what the bureaucrats come in and tell them they bring legislation in and say here mr uh representative or mr senator uh, I want you to pass this bill, and here's what it's about. And then they go do all their, their backdoor work in a lot of cases, and, you know, some of it's on the level and and uh, public. Uh, in that case, there was no public hearings about it at all. It was all done under the table and in closed doors when the rest of the public wasn't allowed to come in the Capitol. So, so what, you, what I think I'm hearing you say, the change was, even though it was executed or uh, affected by the legislators, it was a consequence of the Agricultural Commissioner or his bureaucracy that wanted to make the change. That's, Correct. That's what you're saying. Correct. Okay. So, so to follow up there, do you think um, you've talked about this department that maybe has 300 people? Do you see um, the possibility of, of uh, belt tightening? I mean, would you like to downsize the number of employees in the department? What are your plans for that? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, I believe in small government. 
the fewer people there are, the fewer there are to, that can cause harassment to the people. And so, uh, yes, I absolutely intend. I've got a, a general goal of about 20% that I think can easily be cut from that department, and that's in personnel and in spending. You know, I'm sick of paying taxes, too. And, uh, you know, one way to cut the taxes, and everybody, I've listened for, what, about three years now, do we cut this tax or do we cut that tax just to open another tax and expand it? It's like, how about if we cut the cost of government altogether, and then we don't need as much tax money to start with? And so I'm making that commitment that I intend to cut the uh, budget for that department as well. Roy, have you have you taken uh, a, a thorough accounting of the department in terms of who does what, what jobs uh, are necessary, and the costs to be able to make that statement at this time? Yes, sir. So uh, one of the things that I've seen is a is a heavy cost in travel expenses. And I've done a lot of travel through the military. I understand about travel budgets. And uh, and I also understand when I'm looking at something where uh, where money is frivolous and, and being wastefully spent because I've actually seen it through the military. Uh, you know, in the military, we were rewarded with, here's a bunch of money, and if you spend this, we'll give you more. And if you don't spend it, we won't give you as much next year. So I've actually seen how that process works. And, uh, and I'm very conscientious about spending the taxpayer's money. And, uh, and in looking at the budget for the Department of Agriculture, I did analyze that the travel costs were very excessive. Uh, there's unnecessary travel in there that can be cut back. And, uh, and there's some other programs as well. When you look at uh, uh, the various uh, uh, headquarters staff, for instance, is a huge piece. And they're taking a big piece also of grant money. Uh, their policy is to take 40% of grants. So a few years ago, uh, there was a program for veterans that was implemented. Uh, they worked on a very small budget. It was mostly donated money, and uh, and they did a wonderful program. Uh, then all of a sudden, they got a few hundred thousand dollars, to, uh, close to the tune of 400000 and uh, and their policy was to take 40% of that. Now, most organizations that are managing grants will take a slice you know, it's anywhere from 5% on the low end. Uh, typically, it's around 10% uh, and could go upward of 20 to 25%. 25% is usually on the higher end of managing organizations who get grants and then distribute mm -hmm. that money out. Actually, uh, let me challenge you on that. Okay. Uh, some of them can be over 100%. Okay. Depend upon the area. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, 20%, 40%, I think generally is on the low side of some of these grants. Okay. And, and I won't doubt that some are that high because I have heard of mm -hmm. of organizations that uh, folks really just don't want to be a part of that are because they're excessively high, but it's not the average. Uh, I would challenge that the average is somewhere uh, maybe uh, 10 to 25%. Uh, and so, you know, when you're a government agency uh, and you're taking that much out that was intended for the people that are supposed to be benefiting from that grant, we need to give more back to the people that are supposed to be part of that grant instead of skimming it out to use for just another government job. Uh, Roy and, and Bill, we're out of time here. Uh, Mike Cornby, who owns the place and is a delegate, says uh, if you can provide him what the bill number was that uh, that uh, provided that fee on okay. – on, uh, uh, Farmers market uh, on the permits. Permits, yes, yes thank sir. you. Uh, he'll be happy to look into that for you because uh, okay, you piqued his interest Hornby. on that. Yes, the guy that owns the place. You'll, you'll, I think he may be out front on your way out. I'm not okay. sure. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> uh, we're out of time, Roy. A uh, lot more thank questions you. for you. We'll have you back on again, uh, obviously several times because you'll be uh, uh, very much a candidate coming up in this uh, next primary here, Roy. Ramey for Agricultural Commissioner. How do people get in touch with you, Roy? So uh, you can uh, look me up on uh, my website, uh, and it's under construction right now. It's still kind of early, but that's RameyForWV.com. Uh, I also have a pretty robust Facebook presence, uh, and that's uh, uh, Ramey for Ag is the tagline, but Roy Ramey for WV on there. And my email address is uh, RameyForWV at gmail.com. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, sir. I appreciate Thank it. You. It's an honor. Have a great day. It's uh, 9.03.